Good morning, my name is Gary. It's warming up in Michigan. It did not snow yesterday, this being the middle of May. But, uh, hopefully this weekend we're going to get into a little bit warmer weather again. This is a follow-up to the Sunday Grind video answering a couple questions posted by the viewers. First of all, I'd like to apologize for the absolutely atrocious quality of the first upload. The sound levels were, let's just say, too loud in places, too soft in others, and I'm still learning how to make videos. That's my excuse. I'm sticking with it. What I want to talk about today is the surface finish that I was able to achieve with the planer, and this was shown in my plane machining video how I actually did this. And then in the Sunday grind, I ground the tool bed. So some people would ask me about what is the quality of the surface. I did some rough calculations in the Sunday grind video, and doing things in my head, I dropped the term, and the numbers I came up with were about 40% too large. So when I said that theoretically, using the numbers I was using, that I could get about a 78 micro inch finish on the large plate with this planer, in reality, when I calculate that, I get a number more like 56. So the real question is, do those numbers make any sense? So I have a sample of different surface roughnesses that uh, I picked up from ENCO. And going across and comparing this surface against the samples that are on here, this matches most closely the 63 micro inch. And the choices are 32, 63, and then on up to 125. So my estimate of 58 micro inches is fairly close to what I'm seeing here. This plate I did on the Atlas shape for quite a number of years ago, and I believe that I estimated in the video 25 micro inches when I correct for leaving the term out. Uh, that really should have been a number more like 18. And if I look at the best parts of this plate, it's sitting around the 32 micro inch. Uh, it's probably the closest. It's not as good as the 16, so this may be on a little bit uh, worse off. Of course, this is a piece of junk steel. Actually, both of these are. The finish is going across well, so still getting somewhere in the 20 to 30 micro inch range, I think it's pretty acceptable. Now, of course, to get finishes like that, the tool bit has to be honed carefully smooth. If the edge of the tool bit looks like a gear, it's just going to plow grooves in here. So any imperfections on the edge of the tool bit are going to be reflected in the workpiece. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to move in with a piece of paper and I'm going to run very quickly through the calculations that I did to come up with those measurements. So let's move inside, sit down at a desk, get a piece of paper, a writing implement, and I'll show you how I came up with those numbers. When a shaper or planer cuts, you get a stroke down the length of the work, and then the work feeds or the tool feeds, depending on whether it's a shaper or planer. But in either case, the tool moves over with respect to the work, and then you create another groove and then another groove. If the tool has a circular end, then the shape of these grooves is going to be circular. So what we're interested in is the difference in height between the low point and the high point of the groove. Basically how tall all these little ridges are. So if the tool has a radius R, what I'm interested in is the difference, this little H here, between the height of the crest and the height of the valleys. This right triangle using the Pythagorean theorem, okay, A is the square root of r squared minus b squared. So I want the height r minus a, so I get r minus the square root of r squared minus b squared. Factor the r out of here for convenience. It gives me a square root of 1 minus b squared over r squared. Since b squared over r squared is small, that is approximately equal to 1 minus b squared over 2 r squared without the square root. And then the ones cancel out, 
So the height r minus a is just b squared over 2r. Okay, so that gives me a very simple formula for the height. Now, the tool is actually turned in a shear tool about 65 degrees to the direction of travel. So we don't just move out on the tool a distance equal to half the feed rate. We have to take into account the angle. So going from where the tool is contacting the center to where it's contacting the peak, we're actually moving out on the circle a distance of f over 2 cosine 65. So that's what we need to plug in for B. When we do that, we find the height is equal to the feed squared over 8 times the radius times the square of the cosine of 65 degrees. For my planar, the minimum feed rate is 0 0.0125 inches, 12 and a half thousandths. We have the 8, which came from a 2 and a 2 squared. And we've got cosine 65 degrees. Plug all the numbers in. We get 55 micro inches for the distance from the valleys vertically to the peaks. I'm back out in the shop, and I just wanted to say one last word about the practicality of doing calculations like what I did. I'm sure people will realize that there were approximations. They'll tell me that I didn't account for certain things, that the edge of the tool is not a perfect circle because I could ground a rake on it, uh, all sorts of different reasons. And I'm going to say something about engineering calculations. The purpose of a calculation is not to get as many digits of accuracy as you can. That's bad engineering. The purpose of a calculation is to get something that is useful. And the calculations I did in my head, even though they were wrong by 40%, were still useful because they tell me that the feed rate going across or the, the feed per pass is a very important factor in how smooth the finish I can get with the shear tool. And in fact, doubling the feed rate makes the height of the wave four times as big. So just that little fact is something that's useful in a shop. I had a teacher one time who used to grade papers and you would work a problem out and if you got the problem right, you got 20 points and if you made a little math error along the way, take two, three points off, so you get 18 or 19 or 17 points for the problem depending on what the error was, with one exception. If the final answer was stupid and you didn't know that it was stupid, you didn't get zero. You got negative 20. And yeah, that happened to me once. So, in doing any of these calculations, you have to go and apply a little bit of common sense in checking your results. So, if in my head I had calculated that the roughness was three quarters of an inch, or if I had calculated that it was 78 uh, billionths of an inch, those would have been stupid answers, and I would have known right away I was making a mistake problem that I ran into is I made a very small error. Okay, I got an answer that was sensible. Instead of getting 56, I got 78. And that is in the ballpark of the type of answer that I would expect here. So I wish a lot of the people in my industry and a lot of the engineers that work for me would realize sometimes that the goal is not to get the most precise answer. The goal is to get a useful answer for whatever the question is you're trying to answer. So that's my little soapbox for today. Enjoy yourselves in your shops and be safe.